he said insightful. Strike that. I mean, it's going to be something. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I want to start with this little poll. You know how I love audience participation, right? Who is this? One person has got to know. Nobody. I'm going to give you a clue. Famous actor. Sean Houston was close, but John Barrymore as Spingali. I had to give you the thing. There you, there you go. One guy in this entire group knew Spingali. No, okay, so who is Spingali? He's a hypnotist. And Spingali is a word that most people knew and used in the early 20th century, right? And if you were called a Spingali, you were kind of an evil, creepy guy. And, but, you know, because you would, what would you do? You got people under your control. You were a Svengali. Now, here's the second trivial pursuit question. It's because this is fun, right? It's a rainy day, and, you know, do you, well, you came all the way over here. Where does Svengali come from? Smart guy. Because that was really good, John Barrymore's Svengali. I'm impressed. Where does Svengali come from? Russia. No, where, where, what's the source? Somebody made him up. It comes from the book Trilby. Now, who here, and just be honest, you don't have to, like, lie. Who has actually read Trilby? One person. I love this. You know, we are on a roll. Okay, one person has read Trilby. The reason I ask is because in the 1890s, 1894, 1894, Tril Trilby comes out. It is the biggest selling book in the United States. It is the most popular novel of that decade. It's exciting. You've got Svengali, and he's hypnotizing women. I mean, that's exciting stuff. And James Whistler, the painter, thinks that one of the characters in the book is a little too close to him, and so he sues. And they actually have to rewrite Trilby a little bit. So Trilby is like a very big deal. All right, 1894. There's a hat named after Trilby. That's the Trilby hat, OK? Now, what has this got to do with Trilby? Actually, something. 1894, when you see a painting like this, first of all, you don't see many nudes in the United States in 1894. You don't really see very many. But this, this painting is known. And when people travel, they see it. And in 1894, Polite society, how do you describe somebody who's wearing no clothes? Do you even use the word naked or nude in the 1890s? Another trivial pursuit question, do you even use that word? There is a phrase that is used to describe people that are in a state of being undressed. Does anybody have any idea what it might be? Mm hmm? In the buff is close. N no, it's not the, no one's getting it. And as soon as I say it, you're all going to say, oh, I knew that. She was in the all together. Oh, see all of you. Oh, yeah, we all knew that. Being in the all together. OK, where did that phrase comes from something? Where does it come from? Trilby. Okay, so Trilby gives us Fingali, it gives us being in the all together, lawsuit with Whistler, it's the best selling book. And here's my point. Only one person here knew that book. And it was a very, very big deal. Culturally, it gave us expressions and characters and excitement in this story, and it was swallowed up by history and gone. Boom, poof. So there's a point that I want to make, and that is that most people think that artists get more famous when they're dead, like Rockwell. And the fact of the matter is, Rockwell is the, the big exception, along with Warhol and a handful of very few other artists. Most artists, when they die, you know what happens? They're, they're dead. They're dead. And if there's nobody there to carry that torch 
and promote them, get them on the walls of museums and have them in gift shops and write articles about them, they just become obscure and in 15 minutes it's like you were never there. Rockwell's a big exception. You have to have people promoting you. So here's the thing, here's the thing. When you're reading the paper or you're reading journals, the New Yorker, New York Times, the state paper, whatever you read, you come across this thing where people talk about our collective memory, the collective memory of our culture. And you know, if you read critically, what does that really mean if we remember not exactly one thing about the 1890s? Collective memory's got a lot of holes in it. You know, it's got a lot of huge, huge gaps because what applies to the 1890s applies to the aughts and the 1910s and the 1920s. There's a lot of stuff we don't remember or never knew in the first place. There haven't been just handfuls of artists. There have been not just thousands, there have been millions, right? And most of us don't know who they are. We think that there are some artists that certainly everybody must know. And I know everybody here knows this one, right? This is where you get to feel good after I made you feel so bad. <laughs> this is the feel good part of the presentation. It's, it's Monet. Okay, and every, we'd say, oh, everybody knows this. And in the, when he painted this, okay, in the era when he was early on in his career, he was still unknown, right? He wasn't famous yet. Who was the most famous painter in the English-speaking world? Not necessarily France, but in the English-speaking world, England, America. Highest, highest paid, most successful, earning the most money at the time Monet paints this. You're never going to get it. I'm just making you squirm. Some of you squirm, and some of you are just like, get on with it. Tell us this stupid answer. <laughs> Lawrence Almatatama. He was the highest, he was the most successful, highest paid artist. In the 1880s, the cost of one Tatama would buy every single Monet in existence. By the 1980s, that would be completely reversed. But Tatama was famous, and he was knighted and all of that kind of stuff. And this is one of his paintings called the, um, I guess it was the Discovery of Moses. That's Moses there in the basket. Because, you know, when Moses was plucked out of the Nile, there was an instant parade. <laughs> and, and the queen of the Nile was actually British. You know, but, you know, so Tatama painted these things. And, and to, to me today, I think, how could he have been, you know, so successful? But he was extraordinarily successful. Most people that I talk to, scarcely a notion that Tatama ever existed. And so my point is, long introduction to get to this point, if you've never heard of Jane Peterson, and a lot of people haven't heard of Jane Peterson, that's okay. A whole lot of what our supposed collective memory uh, tells us just isn't there. And it's our job here at the museum to, to sift through this vast, vast ocean of possibilities to put in front of you all the time artists that we think are important and that we think are relevant still. And that's going to be, hopefully, over the next 20 minutes, what I project to you today. Why is she important? She is born Jenny Peterson, not Jane. She's from Jen Jenny Peterson, 1876, in a town, the town of Elgin, Illinois. What do they make in Elgin, by the way? Watches, yeah, some of you probably had an Elgin watch. They were making them when she was growing up. So it's a real town. There's stuff going on. There's an economy. Probably not a lot of opportunities, though, for a young woman, and let's test our collective memory. Why? Because women weren't supposed to do anything in the main, generally speaking. And so she's not growing up right away thinking that she can be an artist. But something is going to happen in Illinois that is really big, not just in Illinois, but big for the entire nation. I'm not going to ask you any more questions, so you can just stop sweating it. Because <laughs> your grades are going to come out, and you know they'll be posted. They're not going to be good. <laughs> not going to be pretty. In 1893, there is the Chicago World's Fair. And this is a very, very big deal that a lot of people, as it again, has dropped out of our collective memory. It celebrated the 400th anniversary of Columbus, which if we did that today, it would be contentious, I think politically. But then it wasn't. And this great big vast pool was uh, 
used to symbolize the oceans that he crossed to get to the United States. And it was designed in part by Frederick Law Olmsted, the, the man who designed Central Park. Tons of money and effort go into planning the Chicago World's Fair of, of 1893. And it is, get this, 600 acres and hundreds of buildings. All countries from all over the world are going to participate in this. And what's fascinating about this is that in the preparations for this, suffragettes, early suffragettes, women activists, came to the fair organizers and said, you know, you cannot leave us out this time. That just cannot happen. And they were forceful and succeeded. And there was a women's building. And this is it. And it was big. I mean, it wasn't small. And who is going to attend this fair? Jane Peterson. And she's going to see this building. And if we needed a great historical lesson for the values of inclusion and including people, where people can see other people like themselves, this was a great historical example before the 21st and 20th centuries. So there is a women's building, and in it, uh, first of all, they do advertise it, uh, that the women's building is there. That was part of the deal. And I know it's, it's not perfect by today's standard. There's the sewing thing and you know all of that. But there's also the artistry and the literature is indicated. And there was effort to get people into this building. And once you got there, you saw artists like this. This is Alice Kellogg. She was a Chicago native. She's an artist who went to Paris, went to the salon, was, was active, was successful. She came back with this painting in 1899 and got into a very big show in New York with this painting. It was illustrated in the Century Magazine, and then it was in this exhibition. So here's Jane, a teenager, and she sees this painting, and it looks, well, you know, to her eyes and to my eyes, she paints as, Alice Kellogg paints as well as the men of her generation. It's a fabulous painting. Anybody know the Hull House in Chicago? That's where this painting is now. So next time you're in Chicago at the Hull House, you can see this painting. Here's another painting that was, and it's terrible JPEG. I apologize for that. But Cecilia Bow, a fantastic, uh, impressive painter in kind of the, you know, the, the style of John Singer Sargent called The Last Days of Infancy. I'm looking at that boy, and I'm thinking, right, get up. <laughs> you, know, he's just, you know, come on. It's over. But, um, but there he is. And the thing of it is, though, exquisite, exquisite painting. Now, these are, you know, so far very maternal subjects. One was breastfeeding, and the other is the, the overgrown boy who just can't get up yet. He's going to have some problems later on. Um, but then there's this, Mary Fairchild McMoney's. These are all paintings that were in the women's building, okay, that I'm showing you. Here are two women, bright sunlight, brilliant color, large painting, having tea, enjoying each other's company. Now, let's just analyze it just quickly. I mean, with, you know, not, not deconstruct, because I can't do that at noon. Are there any kids? No. Are they hanging on to any men? No. Are they outdoors? And you know, usually the, the women of the 19th century, early 20th century, their space is usually domestic. It's usually interior and somehow, you know, reading a book or in the kitchen or nursing a child or something. An exterior space, if you divide this thing up, is dominated by men. But here they are outside and they are enjoying each other's company and they're not working and they are relaxing because they have things to say to each other. And one possible reading of this at the time, not just now, but at the time, is that these are fairly independent people. They are doing what they want to do. They are relaxing. They're not tending children or taking care of some man or doing some other domestic thing. Very modern painting for the time and painted in a very modern way. Bright light, right? bright color, but still very tightly drawn. And so she sees all of these things, Jane does. And then after she sees the fair, which is in 1893, after it's over, it takes six months, that fair takes six months. What book comes out in that year? 
Trilby. I'm just trying to keep you guys positioned. I'm just trying to keep you located in history. So the year that Trilby comes out, Jane Peterson decides, Jenny Peterson decides to become an artist in that same year. And this is like the fair had a big, big part of that. Trilby didn't, but I'm just keeping you historically situated. So she decides to go study in New York. She doesn't have the wherewithal at this point in her life to go to Paris. And she does, and when she gets there, she, she's going to study with Arthur Wesley Dow, who was really an enormous influence on Georgia O'Keeffe, but on lots of people. Dow wrote a book called Composition. It was the biggest book on art instruction of the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries. There were Arthur Wesley Dow clubs all over the United States, from Los Angeles to New York, you could join a Dow Club and get together and discuss his work. She studies directly with him. He is very, very interested in the ideas of how nature translates emotion and sensation. He's very into an, an Asian aesthetic. And he talks about that at great length in his book. And so she's going to encounter firsthand the most important teacher at that time in American landscape painting. That landscape painting is a special thing. Not only can it be morally uplifting, spiritually calming to contemplate nature and its exquisite balance, which she derives from Asian thinking. She gets this firsthand. The other teacher that she has is an artist named Guy Rose, who had been to Giverny and is going to return there, but he's at Pratt for a while while Jane Peterson is there. And Rose is the typical American Impressionist in that nature is great, nature is grand. He inherits this idea from earlier American painters, you know, Bierstadt, all the huge, great, big, dark, heavy paintings that nonetheless also say the same thing. Nature is grand, it's good, it's benevolent, there's a lot of it. The American Impressionists dial that scale back to something a little more manageable, tend to finish their paintings outdoors, but still Rose has the same essential view. Nature is a good thing. A walk in the woods is a healthy thing. Air, water, all the fundamentals, all the things nature gives us to live are good things. And color is a good thing. And so he imparts to his students the basic goodness of being a landscape painter because when you share this with other people, you basically share this uplifting experience. And that is a beautiful thing in this tradition, which is so quintessentially American with landscape. OK, so Jane, at a young age, inherits both of these things from two great teachers. She's very lucky. She graduates at the turn of the century. When she does, when she graduates, what does she do? Some of you know because how many heard me speak last night? I know at least one of you did. OK, so you already know all this stuff. Why did you come again? <laughs> Grand tour. Grand tour. I love that answer. So you know the answer. She teaches. You know, she, she finishes Pratt, and you know, there, there are not a lot of options uh, for jobs for women to begin with. And if you're teaching art, that even <laughs> cuts it down quite a bit more. But she does get a job teaching. And she does that with gusto, but she knows she has to get to Europe to really see more art. She is serious about being an artist herself. So she does that. 1907 is her first trip. And what does that mean? If you get to Europe, if you get to Holland and Italy and France and England in 1907, what do you see? You see all the Impressionists. They're all out there. Cezanne had his big retrospective in Paris in 1907. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And there's an old saying. None of you probably have heard of it. It's called, how do you keep them down on the farm once they've seen Paris, right? And, you know, she's, she's on, if she was dedicated to the arts before she went to, to Europe, she's tenfold once she's seen it. It's completely exciting. She comes back to America and almost instantly begins planning her next trip to Europe. When she does, in 1909, she looks up, she goes to Spain, and she, lo she looks up Joaquin Soroya. Soroya is one of the most important impressionistic painters in Europe and one of the most collected impressionistic painters today. And she looks him up for these 
specific purpose of studying with him. Now, when I look at this painting, I'm showing you this one just because it breaks my heart every time I look at it. Soroya loved to paint water and the sea and people, but he also loved to paint women by the sea. And this is a very, very typical Soroya in the sense that you know, there's extremely bright light on white clothing, women outdoors once again unfettered by children or by men outdoors, you know, not inside a domestic space, and looking very, once again, very independent. And so, you know, Jane has picked somebody very much in a mode that she seems to want to be in. Unfortunately, she doesn't leave us a journal or, ton or tons of letters that describe her state of mind, but her desire to study with Soroya to me is very telling. He will be perhaps the biggest influence on her uh, in her career. So have we even looked at a Jane Peterson yet? I know, I'm taking my time. And I haven't shown you one yet, but here she is. I mean, here is Soroya, 19, 1909. Jane gets back to America. She actually travels with Soroya, brings him to America, travels with him, gets to know him well. This is an early, early Jane Peterson, painted obviously during the First World War. Okay, and this is the first one that we're looking at. And what's similar to Soroya, and this is just accidental, I'm not making too much out of this, all the women are dressed in white, bathed in light, and what are they all doing? They are, they are working, right, making bandages for World War I. They're doing something important. So she sees her subject here as other women, bathed in light, painted briskly, painted quickly, a la Soroya. She's really exposed herself to a lot of art in Europe at this point, and she applies it to a very positive, strong depiction of women, but also she reveals her really her openness to the latest painting happening in Europe, which is still Impressionism at this point, although that's rapidly changing. This is her, still circa the First World War, and really thick, heavy brush strokes. I mean, you just can see her having absorbed everything Soroya had to show her, but you see also her, her openness to the other Impressionists, maybe a little bit to Cezanne. She paints this, she's around 39 years old by this point, maybe about 40, and she has bought in really rather fully to an American Impressionist kind of bent. That landscape will always be about sensation in a pleasing way, but also in a way that is physically, spiritually, morally, all of those things, positive, uplifting. Being out in nature is like respite. Contemplating nature is calming. And a scene like this is having, living with art like this is ultimately a civilizing thing a poetic thing. It's like having poetry constantly on the wall or constantly in your mind or a novel constantly running through your head. It is a way of being connected with ref a refined way of experiencing the world around you. So she gets this from her teachers, from the other artists that she chooses to associate with and look at, and it winds up being a very effective painting style. This is what she can't deal with. This is done around, <laughs> this is done at the same time during the First World War, right at the outset of the First World War. This is Kandinsky. Kandinsky is going to be the anti Jane Peterson, but not just the anti Jane Peterson, kind of the anti American Impressionist. In 1914, he comes out with a book called The Spiritual in Art, and what he is saying is really profound. You know, that color and music are really connected, and color and music and your mind are all really connected, and that you've got to paint more like, more abstractly to capture the abstractions that music and your mind operate in. His book is actually quite eloquent. It's still out if you want to read it, The Spiritual in Art by Kandinsky. Grab that book. It's worth reading. Americans did grab it. A few of them liked it. Many of them just thought it was blasphemy, hated it because it ran against the grain of respecting the facts of nature. And that's where Jane's head was at. 
And this was the kind of modernism that would contest so much American art of the later teens, 20s, 30s, etc. She knew about this, rejected it in favor of this. This is Jane again during World War I, and she gives us a very healthful, uh, elegant, eloquently designed, brilliantly lit image, again, of a woman in an outside space, unfettered, enjoying herself, always a very positive, healthy, uplifting, strong. You can just check off the things that American Impressionism has to offer, and they are all there with Jane Peterson. She travels. This is her along the Nile around circa 1915. She can be very bold, especially again under Soroya's influence. Into the 1920s, you gotta love this painting. <laughs> well, you don't gotta, you can, you can hate it if you want, it's up to you. I can tell you what to do. This painting, okay, not in the show. So when you walk up and you go in there and look for it, I apologize, but I had to show it because I love it. So this one did not make it into the show. She continues with images of really confident women on their own. Uh, in this case, reading. This woman is literate. She's having a drink. She's dressed in the most modern styles. And again, really very boldly. So one could argue that Jane is not completely anti-modern. At this time, most Americans who in the art world would look at this and say, wow, she is really modern. Why? because she's not a polished, you know, realist, you know, detail, detail, detail. She's painting in bright colors and broad strokes. For Americans of the teens and 20s, this was modern. Kandinsky was insane, okay? There's a big difference. Going back to the literature, you know, this would have been considered very, very modern in its time. And Jane, you know, she gives you a woman not only in, a, in an independent setting, but looking you directly in the eye equal gaze confronting you, you know, on her own terms. It's a very telling painting, I think, that she gives us. Ah, 1925. Jane is 49 years old. She finally marries, and she marries um, a man named Moritz Philip, who has a whole lot of money. And, you know, the crowd last night thought that this was funny because I said he did her the favor of dying almost right away. And um, there, she, for some reason, death is not funny, but there he dies and leaves her extremely wealthy. And now she's going to be free to travel as virtually as much as she wants and do whatever she wants. But there's, a, there's something to remember about her biography. She doesn't marry till she is 49. And she's been doing what she wanted to do up until that time. So... Um, She's not going to change pretty much what she does. She's going to continue painting all the time. The thing that she has now is she'll be able to paint from various homes in New York, the Hamptons, and West Palm Beach. This is the home she inherits in New York. I know it's a terrible image because I had to reproduce it from a teeny little, teeny little picture. She doesn't have a, a one floor. This is the house. And she has a studio installed on the top floor. And it's got all the mod cons. It's got you know perfect uh, lighting and uh, you know water and all kinds of stuff. And what it enabled her to do is you know she loved to paint outdoors. But you know now when it's snowing and it's cold and you've got this fabulous studio, you can you can paint still life more often. And artists love to paint still life because you can completely make up what you're going to put in there and you don't have to pay your models. Of course, at this point, it's not a problem if she had to, but you don't have to pay them, and they never move. For those of you that paint and draw, that's sometimes an issue. And she gets into a lot of still life at this period, and her still life work, it really, it slays me in some ways because it is so utterly simple, yet so thoughtfully composed. She is always thinking about the direction of lines, and the, the tenor of her color. And I'm going to step away from this mic and just let me know if you can't hear me. But you can, right? Because I'm going to project to come back. She loves the subtle, subtle, slight tilts of things. And she always does subtle things that keep the loveliest angle opposite the angle of the cloud. So those are things quite contentious. And she will give you some face to face of California. This is mostly yellow. This is mostly blue. This is mostly 
speed and to simplify in order to give you, you know, a powerful immediate experience. This is not an, really an impressionist painting, is it? But she derives a lot of understanding of how to make an image direct and accessible and, and immediate. And it's a very satisfying image to someone like myself who just loves paint and loves something well designed. I like to see a thoughtful hand at work. And Jane is very, very good at that. Part of how she's very good at that is she paints all the time. And she looks at art all the time. And when she sees art that she doesn't like, she'll tell you. Eventually she does, publicly. I wanted to compare these two just quickly because if you really look hard at Jane, there's some simple things that start to come through. She has a consistent way of seeing things that she'll do over and over. And once again, stepping away, if you look at this angle of descent and this angle of descent that runs opposite, it's the same formula. It runs opposite and it runs opposite. And where the body is of the still life is the body of the woman. I don't want to make too much of that <laughs> and force that comparison. But it's interesting because when you look at Jane, she has, she has kind of compositional formulas and theories that she's working out. And she'll work them out with still life, and then you'll see them in a figure, and sometimes you'll see them again in a landscape. Why? She's thinking. She's thinking things through, and she experiments, and she tries things. They're just not always obvious to us from the distance that we have from her now. This is a still life that I think is very vigorously painted, very simple, very strong, once again focusing on a few basic colors, very forcefully done. Ah, so by the 1930s, Jane is already very well known. She is, there's an encyclopedia of American biography, right? You've seen that before in dusty bookshelves, right? She is in that by 1937. She gets into that. Well known. She's in the newspaper all the time. People know who she is. Okay, and here she is painting beachside. How many of you in here, because I know some of you do, how many of you here are actually outdoor painters? Plein air painters. Okay, just a couple. The question now at this point in the talk is, you know, what is the legacy of this kind of painting? Why are we bringing it back now at the Columbia Museum of Art in 2018? And I see some of you shaking your head like, yeah, why? <laughs> that is a good question. And last night, I told the group, look, you know, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer. I have a response, and I'm going to give it to you uh, in brief. Museums, we are always constantly working, constantly working to, to remain relevant and to bring to our audiences the things that we think are going to be not only interesting to them, but useful to them, and that they can oftentimes participate in or see themselves in and start conversations. And that's a tall order, because there is so much out there in the world now to choose from. And part of last night's talk was, if you're walking around with a cell phone, you've got the whole world in your hand. You, if you want to look at something or read something, you can pop it out. Do you even need us? And that was a big part of last night's question. And my response is going to be kind of rather convoluted, I think. None of you, one of you knew who Trilby, <laughs> knew the book Trilby. One of you knew John Barrymore. Most of us are going to go through our lives, most of us, not knowing the millions of artists who have existed, not knowing their names, not knowing their work. Most people are going to go through this world not having visited every museum in the world or every museum in the country they live in or even every museum in the state they live in. So asking about the relevance of individual artists and the relevance of museums is a question on one level, but it's not really the deeper level of how most people go about their daily lives. Most people live their lives focused on their job or their family or getting by in survival, and the things that are important to them in their lives, paintings may be at, not at the top of the list, but what is important Help me with this. Family, people, the things you believe in, you know, your faith, all of those things are important. And 
What art has always done is taken the very important things in any given society, any given society, and has made those things big and has made those things special. All right, here, pretend for a second, little thought experiment. Can you pretend, do you have the imagination to see me as a pharaoh, pharaoh of Egypt? No, everybody's going, God, no, that doesn't work. But if I were, would you bury me in, in a pyramid that was just this big? You wouldn't. You would make that thing very large. And inside of it would be all kinds of riches and things that you needed in the afterworld. All right? If I were Caesar, would you make a statue of me that were this big, you know, and hang it from rear view mirror? No, it would be big and it would be very, it'd be very important. If you had ancestors that you worshipped, you yeah, would you just make, you would make mementos of them, would you not? If you're getting married, some people get married in jeans, not knocking that, but if you were getting married, do you look for a grand suit and a grand dress? We always amplify the things in life that are most important to us. And Jane was in this tradition that I've been talking about, this American landscape tradition that always said nature is good. Nature is positive. This is where you get renewed. This is where you get refreshed. And everybody always thought, look, if I get ill in the United States, what would people tell you to do? They'd say, go to California because the sun always shines and the air is better and you will get better. Nat nature could make you better. Spending time in the woods could make you better. Contemplating a garden could make you feel good. Nature has always been really important to us and the American landscape tradition is hammered away at that. Jane was a very big, big part of seeing the world that way. So whether she was painting people or she was painting nature, which she did most of the time, she was always looking for beauty in terms of decorating, making special the world we live in. And every once in a while, a museum sifts, again, this vast ocean of possibilities for somebody overlooked that you haven't seen that is worth seeing because they did it so long, with so much skill, with such devotion, with such passion, that they left a tremendous legacy of work for you to say, right, people are worth painting still. Nature is still worth having in front of me on a wall, living with this image of nature as a positive, important, critical thing. And here's another great example. She was doing it from the beginning of her career. She does it to the end of her career. Whether, you know, whether it's a smallish canvas or a large canvas, she's going to give you opulent color, well-balanced, well-executed, well-thought-out. One of the things, one of the criticisms, because <laughs> there's got to be one, I was talking with one of our patrons last night after the much shorter talk I gave last night. And they said, well, you know, if you were going to say anything, you know, negative or any criticism of Jane, what would it be? And my criticism is actually kind of a compliment. Her window of imagination was maybe this big. She was focused. She was focused on the world she saw. In the 1940s, when she finally gave a talk about modern art, she just railed against it because she felt the real world that we lived in was the important thing. People that you knew, places that you saw, I wish she would have interacted with it a bit more because I think in some ways she was interested in some of the things the modernists were interested in. Harmony, yeah? expanding your feelings, expanding your consciousness about the world. But she really felt this was the way to go about it. She stayed focused on that. So my criticism actually could be seen as a very positive thing. It allowed her to have this tremendous legacy. People love to be outside feeding the birds and feeding the pigeons. And they may be people who never know one thing about art history. That's going to be most people. And who aren't museum professionals. And that's going to be most people. But they know in their hearts what's important. And when they see a Jane Peterson to this day, an experience like this that is liberated, that is calm, that is outdoors, the word that comes to their mind is beautiful. And I think that that's a word that in contemporary discourse doesn't have to be lost. I think it often is. And so this show for us is a chance to return to it, look at it, examine it, talk about it, because it still goes on. People still care about this kind of painting because I still think they care about these kinds of experiences. And I thank you for listening.